what? Hmm. I can't. Get out. Oh my God. January 24, 1958. The New York Times reported today that Puerto Rico's birth rate is decreasing as a result of the continuing heavy rate of female sterilizations and the migration of young people to the mainland. The rate of sterilization ranges from 10% to 42%. 42% of the women working in one factory outside San Juan were found to have been sterilized. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Madison and welcome or welcome back to the Madison channel. Today we have our first installment of True Crime in Society for the month of March, which is Women's Month. In this episode, we are going to be discussing the Puerto Rican birth control trials. If you're curious and you want to follow me on my socials, please hit the description box. All of my socials are down below. Definitely follow my TikTok and my Instagram. I'm getting more active in posting. And if you're curious about what's going on with my TikTok, I've been shadow banned, but hopefully I can get out of being shadow banned sometime soon. But that's what I do. That's where I post the most frequently. And if you're new here, please hit the subscribe button if you like the content. Hit that notification bell so you know exactly when I post. And check out my other videos. There's a mountain of content for you to catch up on. And I hope you enjoy this video and all the other videos. If you are returning, I love you. Thank you for returning. Mwah. Love you guys. Please like and comment on this video so it does better in the algorithm. And be sure to tell a friend, share the video, do whatever you want to do. But I hope you enjoy it as well. For both of you guys, new and returning, watch all my ads. You know a bitch is newly-ish monetized, and it would be great if you could watch all my ads and not skip them. It helps the channel, and it helps me provide more content to you of the things that we both like to talk about. Hmm. So, March is Women's Month, and it's not as widely talked about, um you know all the time all the uh, all the way that things like black history month and all of that is talked about but i try to tailor the content that i produce in months like this like february march and may i try to tailor my content around asian american history month in may and women's month in march and black history month in february so the two true crime and society stories that i'm going to be discussing this month are going to be related directly to women at a grand scale and a micro scale so this is first of two and the doc talk that will be coming out next week that i'm going to be discussing is going to be discussing i think i'm going to change it from richard ramirez to um another hbo documentary that i think fits more with the month and i'll update you on my community page about that um but I thought it was fitting to have the first True Crime and Society episode be centered around this topic of birth control, fertility, and um, I think it's just perfect for the topic. It's a story that a lot of people don't really know about or aren't really taught about. It's a pretty dark and disturbing history, and to be honest, I didn't know about it until last year. Um, one of my highest watched viewed videos on this channel is me discussing Agent Orange. It was my first video to reach over like 500 views, over a thousand views. It was my first big video. And in the comments of that video and the comments of the TikTok where I'm talking about the topic of Agent Orange, many people were in my comments talking about the Puerto Rican birth control trials, which is something that I think I heard maybe in passing, but never really researched on my own or knew much about on my own. So um, I made a point then to put it in rotation for this year when I was writing scripts because I thought that it would be a perfect topic to discuss during Women's History Month. It has so many topics that are still in discussion now. You know, we obviously know that last year Roe v. Wade was overturned, and I think this conversation about birth control and contraception and fertility and the woman's body uh, being discussed in this way um, has a lot to do with what we're discussing in this video. But also there's the intersection of race, intersection of class, intersection of a long history of America 
uh, of experimenting on BIPOC people, specifically BIPOC women, when it comes to their fertilization and their sterilization and things of that nature. So I just thought it would be a perfect topic. And thank you for anybody who's watching this video who uh, made a point to comment that on my TikTok because I listen and I take suggestions. You guys may not think it, but I do take suggestions for video topics. So bring them my way and I will, if I'm interested, I'll add them to the rotation. We're going to discuss the Puerto Rican birth control trials and um, the lasting effects of them. Let's go. So let's backtrack into the 1950s and when the MAGA people are talking about making America great again, this is around the time period that they're talking about. This is dubbed as America's golden age. Post-World War II, we're riding on a high wave of victory. We helped out Europe. We helped end the war. It's a big deal. The atomic bomb was us. We are the most powerful nation on the planet at this point. And a lot of people returning home and procreate, pro procreating with their wives and thus the baby boom begins now the reality of living through this time as a woman is a lot different um is a lot different than how it's portrayed to us watching it in movies and shows like um you know mad men and things of that nature right um there was a lot of conversation starting to bubble over about pregnancy, about women's ability to control their pregnancy, family planning, and this and that. And that is related to something that we don't really discuss that much um, when it comes to second wave feminism and what pushed it into the popular zeitgeist, which is the effect of war. World War II happens. We enter the war in 1942, if I'm not mistaken, after Pearl Harbor. And this is the second time that women are pressured and encouraged to be a part of the workforce. And this is something that fundamentally starts to disrupt the very fabric that this country was built upon, which is men provide, come home, they work, women do the house, women have babies, women do that. That's a woman's job. The woman's sphere of influence is in the house, helping the children, you know, culturally influencing the children, but a man's influence is out in the world and all this stuff. And all of these cultural norms that a lot of people take to be natural to our genders and our gender roles are always put on pause when things like big world events like a world war or sicknesses and stuff like that disrupt the whole functioning of our society right so world war one happened and this also happened in world war one but this really really took shape in world war two when women things like Ro rosie the riveter and imagery like that women going into factories to take the pl place of men who were in battle and what people don't understand is this taste of freedom for women earning their own money being able to manage their own money while managing a household going to work having this independence being able to socialize with other women who are their age being able to talk to women without uh, having adult conversations and not just interacting with their children or the children of their family was a huge cultural shift and a lot of women enjoyed it they enjoyed the newfound independence they enjoyed the ability to go and do as they please because the cultural norms of what a woman was supposed to be was paused during this time and then the war ends and then the men come back and then women are expected to kind of bottle that independence and newfound control over their life and shove it to the back shelf and resume their role as being treated like a child patronized by their husbands or their fathers as being you know reduced back to your only sphere of influence is the nuclear family is the home and a lot of women were unhappy with this reality a lot of women which is why there's this kind of um thing of the housewife who's on pills 
the Valium, you know, the uppers, the downers. If you want a good movie on this representation, look at um, Valley of the Dolls. This is, I love that movie very much, but it kind of talks about that in the sphere of Hollywood. But there was an influx of women who were just on pills, whether it be meth <laughs> or meth adjacent or, you know, downers so they can sleep at night. But the reality underlying that was women were dealing with the fact of having independence and then having to reframe that independence while dealing with a war traumatized husband at the same time and what having to manage those emotions and a lot of times it would end up in depression it would end up in a lot of different things leading them to have to take mood stabilizers and stuff like that so i just want to do a quick side note right here so when you're on TikTok and you see the hashtag trad wife trending, remember this. These women are cosplaying as what they see to be the traditional expression of being a wife and being a girlfriend and being a woman in this modern society, which is cosplaying as a 1950s housewife. When in reality, when the reality of that existence was often fraught with being t talked to like a child, being abused by your husband and no one caring, having to deal with kids, being abandoned, and also being very much on drugs and pills. And so the wife and the lifestyle that you're cosplaying and trying to make this popular thing at this point in time, a lot of the women who were doing it for real in the 1950s were extremely unhappy doing it. And I think a lot of these women would have a different conception about the trad wife trend if they were there, if there was no choice or active choice of what a woman could be. I think that what they do in those hashtags is like, well, feminism, I was a feminist early on, and then I removed that and became a traditional wife, and now my life is so much easier, and I'm so happy, and da-da-da-da-da, right? The reality is, <laughs> you have the choice, and that's what all women who were feminists were fighting for in the first place. You made the active choice over your life to decide to cosplay as a, a 1950s housewife and that's fine but don't shame women for wanting to work and don't shame women for not wanting that existence because that's not natural or true to being a woman we have the right to choose and you're choosing to do this and that's fine but if you were back in the 1950s and you had no choice and the real restrictions of what that lifestyle was like during that time uh, were apparent I don't know if you'd be as excited about it. And that's just facts. So stop trying to antagonize people by calling out feminism and being anti-feminist when it is that very push for feminism that gave you the option to choose what you wanted to do with your life and not be forced into um, what you should do because you're a woman. So let's just say that. But people don't really talk about this period in its truth because a lot of people, this is the last time, in my opinion, historically, America was great. So Americans, particularly Americans, like to hang on and white knuckle this memory that a lot of them weren't alive for, weren't sentient for, about what America stood for during this time frame based on movie representations and depictions of this time without understanding the very dark-sided things that were also happening. The fact that black people had no rights, the fact that lynchings were still going on, Emmett Till was happening exactly during this time frame, and women were, you know, dealing with a lot of complex emotions because of their reduced sphere of influence when the men came back from the war. Now, I say all that context to say, because it's important, the idea of being pregnant and having control over your, over your pregnancy started to be, to be a topic of discussion because in reality, there wasn't really open conversation about contraception as well as widespread use of contracep con contraception, knowledge of what to do to have safe sex and all of that kind of thing conversation about family planning in general 
in the national sphere of conversation. And that's because of something called the Cornstalk Laws, which were put into effect in 1873. And these laws basically prohibit, prohibited any conversation of sal- of the salacious type to be talked about um, publicly, to be sold widely, any kind of conversation about sex in contraception. These laws were against all of that. And they were still very much in effect during the 1950s. So, like I said, there are different things of contraception that were very much out there. Condoms were invented, diaphragms were invented even, but the ability to teach someone how to use that was illegal under the cornstalk laws so yes there were contraception contraceptives that were in existence but unless you were in the know or if you knew someone if you knew how to even get them in your state because a lot of states just kind of outright said you know we're not selling that kind of stuff um for its salacious and suggest suggestive nature It was illegal to even teach people how to use contraception on a wide scale. So what women were facing in reality was a very long window of time that they were open to be impregnated by their spouse or whomever. You know, that's about 30 years before menopause where you can actively, in theory, get pregnant, which to women who are just coming out of this time of independence and having control of their own money and their own family and you know managing that was a frightening thought because for some people and for some women they don't see their value intrinsically as birthing the next generation for some women especially women who are have the fresh taste of independence on their lips after world during world war ii for some women the thought of looking down the barrel at 30 years of fertility where you could just have a baby over and over and over again. You can have 10 kids, you can have 15 kids, you can have all these kids for all of this amount of time without any way to control it, any way to talk about it, any way to learn how to control it, um, was a frightening, frightening thing to look down the barrel at right now during this time in particular the main form of contraception for women was a hysterectomy or sterilization and you know (laughs) for some people like this is the thing and part of the difficulty of being a woman right because you know I'm on birth control and I experience some of the side effects of birth control I think a lot of women my age are on birth control or maybe just got off in order to try to have children or whatever but the advent of birth control was one of the singular most important inventions of the 20th century for the ability of women to be in the workforce and have more independence and there are a lot of side effects associated with birth control But at the same time, that doesn't really, for some women it does, but that to me doesn't really lead me down the road of also wanting to have um, a hysterectomy. And so basically for women, there were two options, a diaphragm that you didn't know how to use, nor were you ever taught to know how to use it, nor could you really get it unless you knew somebody or you could just have kids for the rest of your life until you menopause hit you. Or you could have a hysterectomy after you had kids, but that was only made available to you after you had children. So you already had to become a mom to have the option of begging them to take your uterus out so you didn't have kids anymore. So (laughs) the options are slim. The options are tough. It's kind of this uphill battle thing. And um, this is kind of the the background for the need and the push for the birth control pill to be invented. Now, here enters a very polarizing figure. This polarizing figure is Margaret Sanger, and she had been a suffragist. She had been an advocate for women's rights and autonomy for a very long time. But here enters Margaret Sanger wanting to invest and come up with another option for women that wasn't um, becoming a spinster, (laughs) becoming a complete spinster or um, having a hysterectomy, something in between where, you know, it wasn't permanent and women could also have autonomy and peace of mind to know that they could basically control whether they were pregnant or when they wanted to become pregnant or not now (laughs) 
Margaret is a very polarizing figure, point blank period. It depends on who you're talking to um, when it comes to how they talk about this woman. If you are Native American, if you are a black woman in America, and in this case, if you're Puerto Rican, or in general, a woman of color, if you are a mentally ill person or poor, she can be viewed by some of the things she openly said as being openly racist, openly classist, and openly um, big on eugenic, eugenicist talking points. And so... But when you talk to other people and when you kind of compare the truth of what she said and lived and existed within at that time versus how she's kind of lifted up to be this big figure, you see that there's kind of a disconnect between what we mythologize about Margaret and what we choose to tell about Margaret publicly and the truth about who Margaret was living and breathing every day during this time as a person and fortunately for us a lot of that stuff is recorded unfortunately for us a lot of people don't want to talk about that part of her personality um to me I think um you know actually we'll get into that a little bit later but Margaret Sanger is a polarizing figure who a lot of her advocacy for women controlling their uteruses, for things like access to abortion, for things like, um, you know, pushing the charge for birth control are really based in very racist, classic, classist, um, ableist, uh, eugenicist ta- talking points. And um, I think that's important to be said because... Um, It's just factual. It's just factual. It's it shouldn't be surprising. She is a woman of her time. She's a woman of a particular time period. She's a white woman of a particular time period. But it's facts. You know, she she a lot of what she was pushing for was because she was trying to um, stop the growth of, in her eyes, undesirable populations. Yes. Now, I just want to take a moment to kind of divine what a eugenicist thought process is. Um, (laughs) I guess you could say eugenics is very close to Darwinism and that kind of thing where it's about survival of the fittest, who's the fittest, and all of that. And I think it's applied to... Darwinism applied to our modern day life and not just to nature. That's what I would put it as. Um, You know, when it came to Europeans trying to justify why they were mistreating people all over the globe and colonizing them and abusing them and killing them and genocides and causing all this kind of stuff, diverting all their funds to them, all of that kind of stuff. A lot of the reasoning if you look back in the day, is based in a very Darwinistic kind of ideal where they were white, they were civilized, and their whole point of existing was to civilize the people who were darker than them, poorer than them, and didn't live exactly how they lived, right? This is why um, there's a lot of literature about this. There's a lot of conversation about, you know, when it comes to pseudosciences and race sciences, this was a core belief of that. And it's connected to Darwinism in the fact that because they were civilized by their own metric of measuring, um, they were, you know, the survival of the fittest they were the fittest you know and it was their duty to make the entire world fit and that's how they viewed it eugenics comes from that thought process where it started as more of a discussion to justify the mistreatment of other people who are different than them and then it turned into a pseudoscience that a lot of very famous people believed um Disney was one of them. Ford was one of them. Um, You know, obviously the Nazis, we know this. But quiet as it's kept, Hitler got a lot of his ideas and ideals from the United States. So eugenics was alive and well in the United States. The idea of categorizing someone's value based on their race was um, also a part of eugenics. And so when it comes to eugenics, 
and what people are considered undesirable, it almost always includes mentally ill people, disabled people, black people, Asian people, Latina people, people of, uh, you know, Latin descent, um, indigenous people. It always includes that group of people and almost never includes white people unless they are mentally ill, disabled or poor. And this is kind of where this term undesirables comes into play. Um, And this is something that everybody on the team of creating birth control wholeheartedly believed. So (laughs) as you can see, we're kind of ramping up for disaster a little bit um, because their minds are in a place of genuine concern for the woman. Do you know what I mean? Trying to offer another way for them to follow their dreams. A lot of their reasoning for this was this kind of constructed fear of overpopulation as well as racist classic dogma, ableist dogma that basically kind of um, is pushing for a more white um, society if you get what I'm saying. So back to Margaret. In the 1950s, this is when Margaret is really like on fire about finding a pill to kind of coal population growth and can help women have the option to control when they wanted to have kids, if they wanted to have kids and that kind of thing. And um, mind you, by the 1950s, a lot of hormonal and fertility um, experiments and research had been going on for many many years before Margaret Sanger came into wanting to create the birth control pill but the problem was it couldn't be labeled as anything having to do with contraception or preventing pregnancy because that also fell under the corn stock laws so there was a lot of hormonal fertility experimentation and research going on but they couldn't really just openly say we're trying to find another option of birth control or family planning because of these laws that have been in place since 1873. So because of Margaret's push to want to find this um, contraceptive, um, she leaned on Dr. John Rock and Gregory Pikes, who were the leading doctors who were researching hormones and fertility at the time and in 1953 from com- some convincing on the part of Margaret um, they started hunting and researching how they would theoretically go about making a oral contraceptive pill now of course because of the corn stock laws they couldn't get public funding for this so they had to find somebody who they could lean on to fund this very expensive research project and Margaret was able to get in contact with a woman called named Catherine McCormick who was an heiress and she was willing to throw some money around and throw money into the funding and she soon became the the project's primary funding um, for researching how to create an oral contraceptive. So again because of the corn stock laws right um, they were they couldn't they had to do all of this in secret because they were able to secure the funding successfully, they still had to do this all all in secret because this was considered like salacious material because they were researching, um, you know, sex and fertility and stuff like that. So they were doing this entire experiment in secret and they were able to successfully prevent pregnancy in both rats and rabbits, but they knew that they needed to experiment on actual women to see if this actually held and the research actually held. And so what they did was do a secret experimentation on women in a psych ward in uh, on the East Coast during this time. But they realized it was a small pool of women. It was hard to really get a good read um, on, you know, how the oral contraceptive that they were able to invent really worked and they needed to expand their experiment their how they experimented and who they were experimenting on but again this brings into the question this concept of eugenics which is going to be this shadow casting a dark darkness onto all of this research even though the research and the results of it fundamentally changed the lives of women for generations to come but there's always this dark cloud around it because they 
we're experimenting on very vulnerable populations and vulnerable populations that they deemed undesirable and that shouldn't be able to have children. So their first stop was a psych ward, a mental health hospital in the East Coast to experiment on. They wanted to expand that experiment. So naturally, they go to Puerto Rico. They go to Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico officially didn't have any anti-birth control laws. So even though in Puerto Rico, of course, was a territory at this time. So there was lots of logistics that they didn't have to go through if they were going to a whole entire other country. You know, Puerto Rico was a territory of the United States, so there was a lot of red tape that they didn't have to cross because of that. But also, you know, um, they could be safe from the regulations of the mainland United States government when it came to experimenting on other people. So... It was a win-win for them to choose Puerto Rico. In fact, Catherine McCormick was quoted as saying she needed a cage of ovulating women to experiment with, which is just yikes, because it's like, there's so many things that can be attributed to that image, trapped, I mean, no choice, consent, I mean, all sorts of things, like not seeing them as people. I mean, there's a whole conversation, but this is the attitude, the open attitude that they had going into choosing Puerto Rico to be the perfect place to do these trials. So I just want to say this before we really get into the meat and potatoes of this, but there was one singular doctor who was helping during this point, and their their name was Dr. Idris Rice Ray, and they were the only one that kind of put out alarm bells about the level of hormones in these pills that they were going to be researching on and giving to the women in Puerto Rico. Um, You know, they rang their bells on the the dangerous level of hormones and what this could potentially do to um, a woman's body and their fertility and how they're going to respond to it. But of course, none of those warnings were heeded and they continued on with getting the pill into production by a company called seal i believe it's seal no it's gd searly searly i don't know but um a company called jd gd searly went into production and actually created the pills that would ultimately be used on the women in puerto rico and i want to Let me get comfortable. I think it's extremely important to point out that I understand, right, that it was of the times, her ideas were of the times, and this and this and this. But what I want to point out is the specific reasonings to why they chose Puerto Rico let me know that they knew what they were doing wasn't exactly ethical and their goals for what they were doing wasn't exactly ethical because they very well could have tested on women in the United States which might have been more telling because this is the um, suggested uh, demographic of people that they're trying to sell this pill to. But the reality was, you know, the fact that they were like, well, there's all these laws and red tapes in the United States mainland, so we're going to go to Puerto Rico so we can just do whatever we want with this experiment. And it reminds me of the Tuskegee experiment, where people sometimes, when you're talking about that, say, well, it was of the time, and what did you expect them to do, and look what we found out because of that and all of this stuff but the reality is there is some knowledge as to why during the time that these experiments happened there is distinct in records of knowledge of these people knowing that how they wanted to conduct these experiments wasn't exactly above board that's why the tuskegee experiment was only exposed 40 years after by a whistleblower and this is why the situation in puerto rico happened in puerto rico because they knew the way that they were trying to do this experiment specifically was it completely ethical and I think that's a really important point to pay attention to because it's like you knew it wasn't completely ethical which means to me 
it kind of negates the um, positive stuff that came out of it when it came to women being able to earn and their earning potential in the in the workplace and have control over their lives as a woman as an independent person I understand that that's huge and is, again, one of the biggest inventions that change fundamentally the way that we live from that point forward. But it's also like, you have to see the subtext. I don't think their intention for coming out with a contraceptive oral pill was totally above board. I think the story and the mythologization of the experience was made to seem like Margaret Sanger was all about women empowerment and them taking control of their lives and all this stuff. What I really think the basis of pushing for this contraceptive pill was racism, classism, ableism, and just eugenics in in, in general. And so... I have a hard time with Margaret Singer as a historical figure because you can't deny that she completely changed the world. But you also can't sit here and just skirt over the very many recorded instances of her clearly saying her intention is to curb undesirables from having children, which is wrong. (laughs) So... If anyone's trying to cop a plea for these people, shoot bail to these people about the time frame and this and that, I think we all have to be adults and know that very obviously they knew what they weren't doing was completely above, was not completely ethical, was not completely above board because of how and where and who they decided to experiment on. You know what I'm saying? That's the subtext we need to get comfortable with. Like I said, Puerto Rico was deliberately chosen. I think the main three reasons were the fact that birth control was legal there only for medical use since 1937. Um, uh, Puerto Rico was experiencing, like the rest of the world post-World War II, a huge population boom, but accompanied with huge poverty, like big, big issues with poverty. So... In their minds or how they were justifying going here was that this pill could ultimately curb a lot of the issues that were happening in Puerto Rico when it came to poverty and not having enough. And third, uh, Margaret Sanger and her other partners involved in this entire birth control trial, um, a man named Mr. Gamble, who you probably know as someone attached to the na- the company Procter & Gamble, um, they had huge political connections and because of the New Deal, um, which is a piece of legislation that also fundamentally changed the world, there was expanded clinics in Puerto Rico as a United States territory, and those clinics were under the control of Mr. Gamble. So there was already the perfect setting politically for um, them to do this trial, the perfect population of people because they were non-white and poor and uneducated, those are their words, and a system already in place of clinics to dispense said pills to these women so they could do the trials. So to them, it was a win-win-win, and they were able to basically set up shop pretty quickly because they had this foothold in Puerto Rico already with the clinics. Now, I also think it's important to add context about what was going on in the government system with Puerto Rico. And in reality, the Puerto Rican government was also pushing eugenics talking points. They were they were pushing PSAs. It was in textbooks, pushing women to get sterilized, pushing the propaganda that having a big family was terrible for Puerto Rico and was the reason why Puerto Rico wasn't thriving. And so the idea of um, having a small family or being sterilized as a woman after having a few kids was baked into Puerto Ricans society not to mention there's a lot of um, Catholicism and religious stuff attached to Puerto Rican just overall society so these women are being fundamentally told by their government in their textbooks growing up in PSAs in the newspaper in ads that in order to do your duty for this country you're supposed to have a small family so the idea of sterilization was huge and very present 
in the day-to-day lives of a Puerto, a Puerto Rican woman to the point that they even set up clinics in some of the factories that these women were working in so women could get sterilized on the job. OK, so this is something that I, I think is really important to take in as to why some of these women may have been more open to being a part of this pill trial and stuff like that. And we'll get into the, the logistics of what they knew before and what they knew after. But there's a there's already a cultural push for women to have some control over how many children that they have. So I want to just say this. A lot of the truth behind what happened in these birth control trials are shrouded in secrecy or the records have not been publicly found or able to be publicly discussed. A lot of what we know are based on what was publicly said as well as survivors talking about what their experience experience was. And you can listen to these firsthand experiences in a documentary called La Operacion, um, I don't know if you can find it on YouTube. You can find clips on YouTube, and some of those clips I'm going to obviously put in this video. But there's a whole documentary where survivors of the birth control trials are talking about their experience and what happened to them after the effects that they had from their experience alone. But because... um, Obviously, this was shrouded in secrecy because of these corn stock laws, as well as it balancing the idea of ethics in general. Um, There's a lot of information that isn't really known about the truth of why these trials continue to happen. Sterilization has been pushed really internationally as a way of population control. And there is a difference between population control and birth control. Birth control exists as an individual right. It's something that should be built into health programming. It should be part and parcel of choices that people have. And when birth control is really carried out, people are given information and the facility to use different kinds of modalities of birth control. Where population control is really a social policy that's instituted with the thought in mind that there's some people who should not have children or should have very few children. In the documentary, they talked about how a lot of the women tapped to do the birth control trials were found to be women who also had previously given birth at the Proctor, at the Gamble clinics around Puerto Rico. So a lot of times these women would be called up. Mind you, they're already dealing with the information from their government telling them to have a small family. There's also guilt with being hyper-religious. There's also the, the push for sterilization in general to just be done with it all. And someone is calling you up and saying, you know, there's a pill that is that basically what they were telling these women. There's a, ma- a magic pill that can help you control your pregnancy when you get pregnant and stop you from getting pregnant and asking them if they wanted to take part. Um, there was There's evidence that that happened with the people who had already given birth at the Gamble Clinics. And there was evidence, and they talked about this as well in the documentary, of women of these people doing this experiment going door to door in the poorest communities in Puerto Rico um, going door to door and telling these women there's a magic pill you should take it it stops pregnancy it controls pregnancy and that's why a lot of people a lot of women ended up being a part of these trials because they were told one that the pill was extremely effective they were told it was magical they were told all of these things so in their minds they're just taking a pill that they think already has been through trials is already safe they don't know that they're being the they're they're a part of the trial do you get what i'm saying so the way they even delivered the information to get participants for this experiment was extremely extremely shady and would not have been able to fly in the united states in order to qualify also to do this experiment or to be a part of the trial was women who were under 40 who had at least two children of their own they were able they were thought to be the prime population to test this out on so 
you can already see that we are in a recipe for disaster. The way that they chose Puerto Rico in the first place as a place to run rampant with these, with these experiments without any oversight from the government. The way they chose these women... Um, what they told these women to convince them to take these pills, like, it's all wrong, it's all hella illegal, it's all very unethical, and you can kind of see where this is going. Now, the people who were, uh, creating and participating in this, in these experiments were also quoted as to talking about the fact that they believed that this particular population of women in Puerto Rico were very not smart and they thought it was perfect to use them because if these women were able to successfully use these pills then anyone could which is very patronizing and really shady um but basically they lied and a lot of women signed up i think there was about 200 in the trial the numbers vary because again official records are not widely known or not widely discussed but some say 200 some say 1500 i've heard 500 so the number varies but um this group of women were basically manipulated into being a part of this experiment and these women in puerto rico are being pulled in so many different directions the guilt from the church the government telling them they want families being pushed into sterilization and having that normalized so this pill offered kind of a way out where you didn't have to choose definitively if you wanted to have kids or not have kids or whatever but you still had the option to control when and how many kids you were able to have so you weren't upsetting the government at the same time so there's lots of layers of manipulation but these women were pushed and coerced to take part of this because of the culture around fertility in puerto rico at the time and these people knew that these people came here for that specific reason so you know manipulation child so the birth control that they were using on the women in puerto rico was called envoid and um these women were basically told to take 10 milligrams every day of envoid the envoid was a mixture of progesterone and estrogen and um like i said that original doctor dr idris had rung the bells early on and said this is kind of an alarming amount of hormones to be given to people over a long period of time and we don't know what it'll do they didn't listen to that and what you find is envoy was actually 20 times more potent the amount of um, hormones in it was 20 times what's in the current um, formula of birth control to today the modern formula of birth control today so all of these side effects that i'm about to list being nauseous gaining weight headaches you know bleeding different things like that cramping uh, mood swings all of that that we all as women kind of understand because we take birth control and the hormonal stuff is very is hard already to like battle through imagine 20 times the amount of hormones and also being you're being told that these pills have no side effects so when you're experiencing the extreme case of cramping the extreme case of bleeding the extreme case of headaches the extreme case of bloating and nausea and all of the things that you know women on birth control today experience and then you're being told like what's wrong with you you're taking the pill wrong there are no side effects the side effects basically started to show themselves immediately because this was an unsafe level of hormones to be ingesting on a normal basis so again the researchers purposely misled this group of women about the pills and what the pills are for and if the pills were regulated if the pills were even tested the ability of these pills they were just told these pills control fertility and they they had no idea what the side effects were but when these women would come to them and say you know i'm dizzy i'm nauseous all the time some women were even hospitalized it was very common for a huge population of these women had a lot of blood clotting which is something that happens with birth control in general and um you know again women were hospitalized and you come to these people and you say i don't feel well i feel like this i'm dizzy i'm nauseous i'm i can't work 
all the researchers are just looking at you and saying you're not taking the pills right when they're doing this research because they fundamentally don't know what this is going to do on a human subject so instead of listening to these women they're basically saying you don't know what you're talking about you're a puerto rican woman you're poor you're uneducated what you're telling me is happening isn't happening and they just basically ignored a lot of the women's cries for help when it came to the reality of taking this intense amount of hormones daily and you know this reminds me a lot of what um black women in particular in this country are going through when it comes to um you know dying on the table when it comes to giving birth um because a lot of the issue stems from the fact that in a society that is white supremacist the complaints of black people or people of color are often ignored and that has been a part of the culture of basically every institution in society my mom even told me when she was in nursing school in the 80s she was taught that you know black skin when you're giving someone an injection when you give a black person an injection you have to put the injection in harder because our skin is different which is not true so you know what i mean like this runs deep and this still exists today this bias this cultural bias in every aspect of our lives which is just so draining and so annoying um because we're constantly having our humanhood on trial but people ignore us and they were ignored and i think the reality is a lot of the problems that have seeped down in birth control for women gaining weight mood swings all of these things i think had they actually did an ethical experiment and actually listen to the complaints maybe some of those issues wouldn't be as severe even now in birth control but they basically just wrote off this these entire things and was just like well you're puerto rican and i'm american and white and i don't believe you so it's just like child what the fuck now when it came to the trial about 22 percent of women over the course of you know some months decided to drop out completely and um you know they decided to drop out of the whole thing completely uh because of how intense the pills were wreaking havoc on their lives and their body um (laughs) which is absolutely crazy now (laughs) The results of this situation, um, you know, mind you, this is like 1956, but the results of the birth control trials ended up actually surprisingly being inconclusive, um, partly because um, at the end of it, over half, uh, 50% of the women who were originally signed up to be a part of the trials had dropped out. So, you know, the size to make you know their testing size shrunk greatly during the period of this and two there were several women who got pregnant um, during the trial so a lot of the conclusions that the researchers ended up drawing from the pill could be put called into question because of just the actual result of what happened of the pill um but yeah the results kind of were inconclusive And of course, the research team didn't try and take on any blame or hold themselves accountable for that reality. They were kind of like, well, it was because of them. They're uneducated. They didn't listen. They didn't pay attention to how they're supposed to take these pills. So, of course, it was messed up. The results were messed up. And they kind of just blamed it on the women who were coerced into taking these pills that were really damaging to their health. But based on the conclusion that they decided to draw, despite the evidence of the reality of the experiment, the Envoid was crea- uh, FDA approved as a natural way to prevent pregnancy and became widely made and distributed in 1960. This is an important date because the whole reason for them to be in Puerto Rico doing these experiments on these women was to eventually get here, which is to create a pill that actually worked and could be mass created and widespread and mass distributed. But tell me, but and that was 1960, but why, if that was a goal, would they stay in Puerto Rico and continue to experiment on these women for another four years? The Puerto Rican birth control trials didn't end in 1960. 
they ended in 1964 after the FDA already approved the first birth control pill. So again, it calls into question intention. What was the true intention of this? (laughs) If we got to the goal and you're still choosing for four years to experiment on these women in a very traumatic, coercive, unethical way. It's it's shady. And again, this really reminds me of the Tuskegee experiment. And I keep referring to it, but I did an entire video about it last year. Um, and I'll link that in the pinned comment. But, um, you know... <laughs> This idea of already coming up with the solution but choosing to put these people through hell just so you can observe it is a sick thing that keeps coming up when it comes to unethical ways that the United States government experimented on people of color. Um, But yeah, they could have ended the trial, but they kept going for another four years. Over the course of the entire trial, three women actually fully died as a result of taking the pill. Um, But of course, the researchers, the people, the bigwigs refuse autopsies to be done on their bodies. So to this day, there's still really no knowledge of how they died in relation to taking the pill. We just know that three women in the trial died, but they didn't want to do any research. They didn't want to look into it because they feared for their entire project. So they just, you know, ignored it. They all happened to die and didn't look into it at all. So for this to be like the end all be all experiment defining the workability of birth control and you're seeing that they're lying to the people they're choosing specific people for very specific racist and messed up reasons they're ignoring cries for help when it came to the side effects of the pill and three women come up dead and they still didn't research it even though this is supposed to be an experiment based on the effect of the pills on the woman body the woman a woman's body and fertility I start to kind of look at birth control and the uh, severe side effects that it still has today and kind of start to understand why and how because a lot of the research is based on this experiment which was not conducted properly nor was um, the right kind of conclusion came from this experiment at all, you know? So like I said earlier, the birth control, after 1960 and the widespread release of the birth control pill, everything changed societally all across the globe. I mean, women in the workforce, women being independent, women having autonomy over their body and what they could do and what they wanted to do started to change everything. Um, Enter the free love movement, enter women experimenting sexually, enter all of these things that become important to our existence and the changing gender roles that, you know, change forever. So birth control and the advent of it changed everything for women, changed a lot for women. And I think that's super important to note. But we can also kind of note that the core and the underlying theme of why this happened and how this happened was based in eugenics and was extremely racist and polarizing which is why I refuse to give Margaret Sanger really much of anything because yes this was a big deal but also why you did it is still called into question because I just feel like you specifically going towards populations that you found undesirable this fear of overpopulation and not having enough and we need to make sure that these specific people don't have children um which always happen to be people of color which always happen to be poor which always happen to be people with disabilities um i think it's really gross and weird and i think that um it's something that we should talk about because I don't really think I know that she went along with the fact that this was out of the goodness of her heart for all women kind but and a lot of people like to run with that story but in reality I think it's based on racism and it's kind of sad and gross you know when you know this story and the harsh reality of it is the brown poor people were the guinea pigs they fixed and tweaked the formula based on what they learn and now 
rich white people have access women in particular have access to this very life-changing thing when brown people black people the puerto rican women who were coerced into doing this won't even really get more of an ex- more than an excerpt in a history book and are going to very rarely be acknowledged for their massive contribution to shifting the entire American zeitgeist by being guinea pigs um, and being manipulated into doing so to change the course of how we see the world. Anyway. Now, I just want to take you know part of the conclusion just to talk about the fact that the reason why Puerto Rico was targeted was overpopulation this myth of overpopulation and all of this kind of stuff and why overpopulation in these big families are leading to poverty but let's just read statistics about where Puerto Rico truly is now okay so by 1968 puerto rico is on record of having the most sterilizations of women in the entire world puerto rico is still plagued by poverty even though currently it has the sixth lowest fertility rate in the world the population as a whole has is down 11 percent in total and um even though all of this is a reality there's still poverty in Puerto Rico, which kind of dismisses this fear, this claim and fear mongering of the big family, the sex, the amount of kids, the fertility is the reason why there's poverty in this country. The real reason is the, Uni- the United States is greedy and they're making you poor. It's not about sterilizing your women because now there's a whole other crisis going, which is your population is declining. Oh, Margaret Sanger's obsession with kind of hauling out and making sure populations of undesirable people couldn't have children wouldn't have children were sterilized or were on the pill um is really more of a racist thing than a practical thing because as we see the effects of forced sterilizations heavily pressured sterilizations and in the wake of the birth control trials uh, Puerto Rico is not producing a lot of children their population is declining and still they're in poverty so Margaret you're racist now back to the question of why would they continue doing this experiment um, up until 1964 when the birth control pill was approved by the FDA FDA for wide release in 1960 and the question the answer is I don't have an answer because a lot of the records of the true intentions of this experiment are not known a lot of the story that we know is based on people who are survivors of the trauma of that experience who live with lifelong trauma of that experience a lot of women said that they don't even talk to their children about it it's just too much of a traumatic experience that they went through um but a lot of the official records are not in existence so you know it's one of those things where we're just gonna end it here because that's a looming question that we still don't have answers for and i don't know if we ever will but what we can deduce by what all of the characters in this story who were on the researching side all of the things they said publicly what they stood for we can pretty much assume and deduce that what they were saying was a reason to go to puerto rico what they were saying was a goal probably wasn't and it had to do with something eugenics based and race based and class based point blank period this story is a good uh This story is not widely known. I think it's an important conversation to have. I think understanding the history of things that we take for for granted now, you know, I think is extremely important. But also, it's a story about fundamentally what it's like being a woman, what it's like being a woman of color, and all the things that we have to go through um, to benefit greater society at the risk to our health and our general well-being it goes into how we're not listened to and um, how we're seen as a means to an end and not really human people um, which is very disturbing so when you think about contraception understand and have some actual gratitude as to who the people who actually laid the pave paved the way for you to have the ability to choose and have access to this i think that's really important um, um but that being said uh 
look in the description below if you want to follow any of my socials that would be wonderful definitely follow my tiktok i update it regularly i am shadow banned so please like and interact with as much as you can to unshadow ban me um what else uh if you're new here thank you for watching the video comment like subscribe um put your notification bell so you know when to expect a new video from me and um what else if you're returning thank you for watching comment like help this video go up in the algorithm i love you so very much happy women's history month happy first episode of true crime in society for women's history month let's do it and next week expect a doc talk episode i know on my community page i said i would be doing the richard ramirez thing and you know honestly i might just stick with that uh but um i'm kind of I, I don't know. You'll see what I decide. I'll announce it. Uh, but yeah, that being said, Black Lives Matter and Free Palestine until it's backwards.